So I would like to take this opportunity to announce an opportunity that I have accepted. I will be uh, partnering with McLaren Racing next year. Now the details of that will not be publicly announced until a future time. No, nah, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I am sponsored by HelloFresh today. You already know that HelloFresh is America's number one food delivery kit. But did you know that you can now customize your favorite dishes with HelloFresh's new Hello Custom offerings by swapping out one protein or side for another, upgrading for a more luxe experience, or even adding protein to a veggie meal. That means more choices, more variety, and more meals truly tailored to you. The name of the game is customization. With HelloFresh, it's easy to adjust your plan and increase your order size to help with meal planning for large groups or to have leftovers for lunch the next day. And as always, HelloFresh recipes include pre-portioned ingredients and that means less prep time for you and less wasted food overall. The David Land Pit crew is powered by HelloFresh this May. Go to HelloFresh.com and use the code LAND16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. That's HelloFresh.com. Use the code LAND16 for 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. All right, so let's get the Polo drama out of the way first because I guess we're calling this Polo Gate now. Uh, this, is, this situation has reached a new level of crazy today which has absolutely nothing to do with the contractual dispute between Chip Ganassi and uh, Zach Brown. Well, actually, it could. Um, but let's talk about what happened on track first, because Alex Pillow, uh, this was the no good, very bad day for Alex Pillow, um, especially on track. FP2 this morning uh, got into the wall in turn three, crashed the car, lost a ton of track time, and then during qualifying, Pillow's car failed in Q1 and he did not advance. He, he will roll off 22nd tomorrow um, for the Honda Indy Toronto. Now, the kind of the big story and uh, something that, that, that I got wind of last night, I'll put it that way, um, and it has come out today, uh, a video uh, by Austin Oganoski um, talking about some behind the scenes management things uh, with Alex Polo, specifically a YouTube channel which appeared in June um, that was uh, attributed to Alex Polo and had exclusive content uh, of Alex Polo on YouTube. Uh, actually, it was really pretty good content, but it did, was not getting a whole lot of views. And allegedly, Alex Polo's YouTube channel had 150,000 subscribers. Now, Oganoski's video alleges that uh, Alex Polo's management team purchased a YouTube channel uh, to, to create a new YouTube channel that had a big subscriber base for Alex Polo. Now, this was backed up uh, in, uh, this claim was backed up with screenshots in the Internet Wayback Machine of what this channel used to be. Even more spicy is that Polo himself actually has a personal channel, which was started in 2016, which has 100 subscribers. Um, now, it's certainly possible that Alex had little to nothing to do with the creation and purchase of that YouTube channel, but he certainly starred in the, the content that was on that channel. By the way, uh, just before I started recording this video, uh, the entire Alex Polo racing channel was scrubbed so certainly this attention was bad attention and uh, they have gotten rid of this channel uh, or at least uh, any public record that is Alex Pillow's except for the URL very interesting days ahead I think uh, I think they got with their caught with their pants down a little bit here um, certainly we'll hear more about it in the coming days now why is that important um, because I'll tell you this right now I, I know for a fact that other youtubers are doing a deep dive into this situation and you'll see much more detailed content coming out about it in the next uh, couple of days certainly some channels that you're probably already subscribed to but from the perspective of what we know about the contract situation right now with Alex Polo this revelation this coming out um, is very timely and curious at the same time because as a professional YouTuber, if I were to start a YouTube channel, 
um, and I had a budget. My, my first suggestion would not be to go out and buy a YouTube channel. In fact, that would be one of my last suggestions because it's, number one, it's bad algorithmically, and number two, uh, it's a bit iffy on whether it's, it's actually uh, good form or not on YouTube. Now, one of the things that, that Austin Oganoski pointed out in his video and why this is potentially uh, not good at all for Alex Pillow in his current situation is that if this was used to sell sponsorships, if this was used to attract Arrow McLaren SP or McLaren themselves to trying to sign Alex Pillow, because as we know, Zach Hollywood Brown loves big name drivers who bring in big numbers on social media. That typically is his MO in bringing new drivers into the fold, which is one of the reasons I think a lot of people were kind of surprised. Alex Pillow is a championship race car driver, but doesn't quite have that big social media following that, say, a, a, a Pato Award or a Colton Herta or certainly a Lando Norris or Daniel Ricciardo has, which is fine. To me, that's, that's not a big problem. But if that has something to do with why he got on their radar or just in general, I think it points to why everyone was so confused. Scott Dixon came out and said it was straight up the not the right way to do uh, getting out of your contract. Like for example, like Alex Pillow, the way he went about signing with McLaren, even Scott Dixon said like candidly that that wasn't the right way to handle that. And so when you have those sort of questions about management, and then you know with me having that perspective of being a professional on this platform and knowing the ins and outs of it, that's a huge mistake just from a YouTube perspective. So I, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes, and I really, really feel bad for Alex because I, you know, here's the thing, man. I, Alex Pillow to me has been nothing but genuine, uh, a nice person, an honest person. And so to see to see these sort of things coming up is very disappointing for me um, because and I hope it works out for him but this is things aren't going well right now um, and there's a lot of things beginning to stack up and that's it's very sad and I hope uh, I hope things kind of turn around I hope this is you know in terms of bad days I hope this is as bad as it gets and and Alex can kind of turn this around from here because again you know I like him he's a good guy um, I, I truly believe that I but I do think in my opinion he's getting bad advice right now um, so that's the Alex Polo drama out of the way. Let's actually talk about the Honda Indy Toronto. Let's look at the starting grid first. You guys already know about Alex Polo, but it's Colton Herta who, in any other week, he would be the headline guy he tested with McLaren, uh, impressed in Portimao, and uh, no one's talking about him. But he's on the pole position uh, next to Scott Dixon and all Honda front row. Dixon almost had his first pole position since 2016 Watkins Glen. Row number two is Joseph Newgarden and Alexander Rossi, almost a 2019 reunion there. Alexander Rossi certainly back on uh, form and schedule there. David Malukas in row three on the inside, and Scott McLaughlin rounding out the fast six. Malukas has been so impressive, as has McLaughlin this year. Callum Eilat with a great qualifying for Hunkos Hollinger Racing. Felix Rosenquist is racing for his career on the outside. Marcus Erickson and Christian Lundgaard with the best Ray Hall Letterman Lanigan qualifying of the year thus far. Row six, Romain Grosjean and Devlin D. Francesco, the hometown hero in row six. Row seven, Jack Harvey and Graham Rahal. All Rahal Letterman lockout of that row seven. They had a test in Sebring, which apparently they found something. Pato Award, a not very good qualifying. He said they just don't have it this weekend. Will Power does have it this weekend, but once again will be uh, rolling off very at the back of the grid, very bad spot. Elio Castroneves and Simon Pagano next to each other in row nine, all Meyer Shank racing there. Takuma Sato alongside of Renus VK. Sato crashed in practice. Jimmy Johnson starting 21st on the grid alongside his teammate Alex Polo. Dalton Kellett didn't even get to participate in qualifying. Kyle Kirkwood crashed, brought out a red flag, and was penalized. Ditto Connor Daly, at least getting penalized, and will roll off 25th. Tatiana Calderon with sponsorship issues, will not start the race. So the big story outside of the drama is that Colton Herta is hot once again. Uh, you know how good he is on the street circuits, but I think he's brimming with confidence after that Formula One test. You have to think for a guy who's wanted to do that for as long as he has, for it to have gone as well as it did, 
and certainly the fact that it seems like Colton's making all the right career moves um, when we're talking about drivers who could potentially be in that seat starting in 2024. Um, you got to think he's brimming with confidence. But again, the, the inconsistency is Colton's problem. If Colton can just go out there and be consistent, not get, you know, have somebody get inside of his head or have, you know, if there is one of those issues where he pits early or pits late and gets caught out by a yellow and ends up behind other cars, will he be able to recover from that? That has been where his weakness has been, is when, not necessarily when he's dominating the race, but when something throws off that rhythm. So we'll have to see how that goes. Interesting quotes from the drivers um, after practice or after practice and qualifying. It, it sounds like the used reds are actually the preferred tire, which I think is very interesting. It sounds a lot similar to what we experienced at Mid-Ohio, where it almost seems like the red tires fire up after they've had a heat cycle in them. So I think that's very interesting. It took a, a long time to fire up those tires. We'll have to see in the race uh, what the teams prefer, but it seems like when you're on brand new tires, particularly brand new reds, it takes a long time for them to get fired up. So the teams that scrubbed in a bunch of red tires may have the advantage. And finally, the qualifying procedure. A lot of penalties, a lot of red flags, and a lot of talk about um, the qualifying procedure for IndyCar races. And my opinion is this. I think that IndyCar should move to single car qualifying for, um, for road courses and street courses. You don't have to worry about blocking at that point. You don't have to worry about red flags. And everybody would get TV time. And you'd probably fit in about the same TV window, but considering that that practice and qualifying are all on the cock now. Um, what is the point in, in just fitting into a 50-minute window? Um, if it goes longer, if it goes shorter, who cares? I think it would be a fairer system. I think it would be better. Uh, it would be an exciting show, I think, if you just say you get one lap, and if you screw up, you screw up, you start at the back. I think that would be really fun, and it would be very um, fair to the drivers that don't screw up. I th of course, it would definitely pad Will Power's stats because it seems like the only reason he ever uh, doesn't qualify in the Fast 6 is because something stupid happens to him in qualifying. So that's my opinion on that. I think they should go to a single-car qualifying on the road courses, uh, just like the ovals, but I don't run the series, so whatever. Interesting day. It will be an interesting day tomorrow at Toronto. Uh, the first Peacock exclusive race um, so tomorrow I'll not only be talking about the race, but also be talking about the broadcast because this will be the first broadcast of a race I've watched live all year. Interesting angle, I guess. A different angle for tomorrow. So thank you guys so much for watching. Thanks to HelloFresh, and we'll see you in the next video.